A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries who are present here with us today and to all of you uh, enthusiastic participants who are joining this webinar not only from Sri Lanka but from around the world. On behalf of Vimansa Initiative, let me warmly welcome all of you to our very timely webinar on the most iconic development coming up in Colombo, the Asia's newest landscape. I am Deepthi Pereira from Vimansa Initiative, the organizers of this webinar and I will be your host today. Vimansa Initiative is a newly established think tank with a global outlook. We are a policy development and advocacy group promoting a dialogue on sustainable and inclusive development. Our inaugural webinar held in last February attracted a large number of participants from around the world and today we can see the same kind of excitement and we are delighted that Vimansa was able to achieve this within such a short time. It is our great honor to have with us today a very distinguished and exceptional lineup of speakers to enlighten us about the journey of Asia's newest landscape becoming a reality under the aegis of the Colombo Coast City Commission. We are extremely grateful to all of them for sparing their valuable time to make presentations at this webinar. Before we start the webinar, I just want to clarify about few formalities. We have planned to have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. However, due to the very busy schedule of our keynote speaker, we will have a short Q&A session after the first presentation. We invite all of you to actively participate in this webinar by sending your questions for the presenters through the chat window which is accessible to all of you right now. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our renowned keynote speaker to take us through the journey from conceptualization to realization of Sri Lanka's iconic development. He is one of the busiest person professionals in the country with an unprecedented career, working with many presidents and prime ministers cutting across the party lines. With his exceptional experience in policy development and implementation, he played a prominent role in the Colombo Port City development from the stage of conceptualization to the current state of development. Let me warmly welcome none other than the Secretary to His Excellency, the President of Sri Lanka, Dr. P. B. Jayasundara. Dr. Jayasundara, you, you may start your... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, uh, warm remarks. Uh, and also let me congratulate Viman Sa for a very rapid uh, expansion in last six, seven months from its inception. And also let me thank Vimansa to organize this important event and invite me to share some of my thoughts on the topic of conceptualization to realization of Colombo Port City. As you may recall, this conceptualization is based on a 2005 presidential election uh, to which President Mahinda Rajapaksha sought a mandate. It was his brainchild, is what we are seeing now as a Colombo Port City. When he assumed office in 2005, uh, December, Many people never thought this is a very serious uh, proposal as country was uh, in the midst of a prolonged conflict. However, while he focused on the conflict resolution strategies, President Rajapaksha also appointed his key officials to work on his development program to create a new Sri Lanka. 
he appointed Dr. Priyad Bandhu, a very young engineer as the chairman of Sri Lanka Port Authority, and one of his tasks was to conceptualize the engineering aspects of Colombo Port City. He also appointed a young engineer called Mr. Dr. Mr. Rajit Premasiri as Secretary of Transport and these two officials worked very hard on a, in the background to get this process going. Fortunately, Sri Lanka saw an end to the third year long conflict in 2009 and by that time most of these initiatives has also begun to see the light of the day. Since then, the government of President Mahindra Rajapaksha work on this line of ports and port city conceptualization became a reality. It was in the same time country embarked on a massive infrastructure development in the line of a silk road development that the President Mahindra Paksha has recognized and at the same time it became the Belt and Road Initiative of the present President of China, People's Republic of China, President Xi Jinping. Two ideologies two wavelength in exploring Asia's uh, development was seen eye to eye and in the eye of President Xi Jinping's arrival to Sri Lanka in 2013, the foundation was laid to begin the port city. So two leaders started the port city on that basis. Since then, successive government up until President Gota Raja Paksha took office in November 2009 had committed to develop the port city and hence it is every government has accepted the need and the necessity of this landmark development in this country. Now, President Gotabe Rajapaksha gave utmost priority to start from where it has been and more to fast track. And though the land has been reclaimed with some delays, there has not been a legal framework to get the port city into a completely independent economic hub in this country. So as a result, he requested the Prime Minister to appoint the committee and I am glad President Council Nihal Javadana, who sat in this committee, committee to formulate this legal framework in consultation with several eminent lawyers in this country and subsequently to get the feedback from the massive resource base available in countries, Attorney General Department, and we have now seen a new legal framework has evolved. This legal framework is essentially based on a concept of Greater Columbu Economic Commission that Sri Lanka had in, two, in, in 1977 to set up economic zones and also based on some experience in running some successful economic zones in the country. It was also done having regard to our constitutional framework and also the laws of the land which need to be recognized in this kind of new development model. The the conceptualization has also taken into account 
various other models in the region to see that see how sri lanka can be placed on a more competitive environment or more advantage position than some of those countries this is how the legislation was framed and i am sure president council who is a member of this panel will explain how the legal framework can be its relevance to this new city the legal we have followed due process the law has been now accepted having got the approval from the cabinet and the honorable attorney general department country's legal draftsman skills country attorney general's input and everybody sir other participants have got into this process it fairly a large involved process and now it will be scheduled to place before parliament by third week of this month and after the due process of obtaining the observation of the supreme court the legislation will be taken up in the parliament for debate and i hope and expect that this legislation will be a reality by the end of this month so in other words today we can see there is a reclaimed land which is basically going to be the the land mass for the new economic zones and we also now see the filling uh, missing gap that was the legal framework to create a new economic uh, development uh, zone in this country we have designated this legislation as kalambu port city economic commission commission will be independent the objective of the commission is essentially to be a one stop investment center for investors it is also a, a concept that has been basically recognized for a certainty in investments certainty is very much in my view is there because it is not one particular government has taken got involved in this process three successive governments uh, has got involved in this process verified its relevance it has gone through the country's environmental uh, impact assessment and also the value addition to this nation from developing a new landscape in formulating this legislation every single legal framework in the, the country whether it is the banking whether it is land alienation whether it is uh, taxation whether it is customs or any other relevant applicable laws have been taken into account and has created one composite masterpiece for kalambu port city economic commission bill that bill recognize all and the honorable attorney general has given the clearance that it is constitutionally consistent in sri lankan framework we have also integrated several important elements into this new development and i would like to touch upon few one is backward integration of kalambu port city development to sri lanka's overall development the from unskilled to the highest professional level of people in this country this will become a new employment destination and in order to recognize its international standing we have also made provision in the law that they such employees whether they are unskilled or semi skilled or professionals 
they will be treated as they will be they will be paid in foreign currencies and they will be considered as foreign income earning people in this country there is also provision to integrate supply chain from sri lanka's various supplies required for the functioning of this kind of a city and to that extent it will be one of the export destination for sri lanka to generate huge sums of foreign exchange opportunities here landmark is also important to understand it was developed by a china harbor corporation um, uh, uh, of china it was developed on the basis that they developed they reclaim the land create the environment for uh, development on the assumption that they will take they will recover they are part of investment from the land alienated to them rest of the land belong to the government of sri lanka government of sri lanka land consists of two components one is public goods part of the overall city where uh, transportation uh, parks and uh, yeah. recreation sorry uh, thank you very much uh, i think my my boss uh, uh, on mute sorry about that thank you very much dr jayasundar for sparing your valuable time today uh, to be with us and to join this webinar thank you very much once again and uh, we already have very interesting questions coming up and i hope you can uh, have time to take a couple of them uh, yes okay uh, so here is a very interesting question from uh saying we uh, asking please give a detailed explanation on dollarization of port city advantages and disadvantages of such arrangement and the commission will have chairman and board of directors with international reputations and we will be advertising internationally to seek the required personnel for this landmark event and i hope this legislation will place sri lanka on a global map as the most attractive investment destination in asia parallel with the the emerging asian development priorities in uh, in shifting from west to east global development and also the hammond to the port kalambu port city and the kalambu port itself becoming part of this whole integral development that will create sri lanka's new service economy into a much promising uh, transformation of sri lanka's landscape thank you very much I I can uh, go directly <laughs> to save time. Okay, if uh, you're busy it? now, maybe I can just uh, you know follow the doctor's uh, uh, presentation. Oh. I Yeah, Port City is a separate financial center. We have created it as an international financial hub. It will have a separate uh, international financial transaction activities. And what we are basically asking is, you know, to create a much more financial base 
international business here in Kalambu Port City. We, we do not integrate that with the rest of the country and we have kept the financial uh, 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 overall uh, controls by limiting financial transactions to Kalambu Port City activities. Having, uh, having such a foreign currency base, I won't call it a dollarization because it recognizes all international foreign currency based transactions and what we are looking for is having such a international financial transaction right next to the uh, Colombo, Colombo is an advantage for the Colombo base economic activities because some of the uh, some of the backward supply chain activities will create foreign exchange earning capacity to Sri Lanka as well. I do not uh, see uh, uh, much of a risk and probably at the latter stage probably a much more greater financial integration would be, would be a welcome initiative but the early stage these two are two, two separate centres but it will be essentially a Sri Lanka's uh, financial, uh, international financial centre that will help the country's development as well. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jayasundra. Uh, we are actually getting inundated with questions, uh, but I hope uh, we can take another one. Um, uh, this is uh, Kapila Karuna Ratna from Abu Dhabi asking, number one, uh, what are the plans for offshore financial institutions to operate in port city as pre-zone type operations? And number two, yeah, uh, there are two questions, so I'll ask both of them. Uh, number two, what are the planned business development slash marketing initiatives with our foreign missions to drive potential parties? First question is, uh, uh, it is essentially uh, a law provide for international financial offshore banking transaction in the place and we, we will be communicating with our uh, foreign missions abroad. We are working closely with the Ministry of Foreign External Affairs and also our foreign mission to concentrate on the, this new development. Soon after the legislation is passed, Port Commission will be institutionalized and the Port Commission will undertake a much more consistent, coherent marketing strategy to take the port city global. Yes, um, I think uh, uh, due to the time constraints, uh, we have other presenters, but maybe there is one more question uh, which will be uh, very uh, useful and I think a lot of the younger generation will be interested in knowing this. Uh, the question is from Janit Tabesekara uh, asking, uh, one of the most important factors for the long-term success of international financial center is the abundance of skilled labor access in the country. How is the government planning to eliminate the lack of skilled undergraduates in the future? Very important question and it is one of the major development priorities of President Gota He His government has given a significant emphasis on the education reform targeting three stages. One is the university education shifting to much more professional employable new skills being created and one of the key employment market is Port City. In fact, most of our New Sri Lankan youth coming out from our universities, from medicine, engineering, legal, commercial, accountancy and various other services plus very skill type of uh, specialized jobs will be available uh, um, and our education system has been reoriented toward that. While universities are being targeted, 
there are also new degrees are being offered to liberal arts graduates on the IT education, which is one of the most sophisticated deep areas where uh, IT and software companies are looking for. Second stage is the skill education, where Sri Lankan labor force is to be a skill development oriented uh, training program and, and reforms are being initiated targeting from six months to two year program and those skills will also be basically available for the port city development and so education is education plus several other reforms I must take even little bit extra time. Sri Lanka is not only doing a piecemeal reform at this stage, we have taken a reforms in our taxation strategy, government has taken a reform in financial sector altogether, government has undertaken custom reforms at this stage, government has appointed a presidential commission to simplify the rules, regulations and structures, then government has also uh, created new legal framework under the Ministry of Justice to address law delays and dispute resolution and creating specialized commercial like uh, special courts to, uh, to address various business dispute and eventually Sri Lanka will also have its own arbitration centers using our best professionals in this country. So it is very much a knowledge-based development center. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Jayasundara, just one more question uh, from one of our uh, foreign uh, participants from uh, David Lee. Uh, he's asking two questions, so I'll just ask both of them together. From an interested foreign investor's perspective, I see there is little encouragement for the local private sectors to join the investment and development activities within the post city. Example, local companies would not be allowed to invest in uh, Lankan rupees other than purchasing land. What's the consideration behind this lawmaking? And he's also asking, asking, it seems that local banks will not be allowed to lend foreign currencies to facilitate the uh, development of the port city. Would they be allowed to lend Lanka rupees in this regard? No, I think we, we have to uh, uh, consider the development in Sri Lanka and port city as two, two uh, separate issues in the early stage when it comes to the financial market. We have permitted Sri Lankan investors to purchase land in terms of the Land Acquisition Act by paying in rupees. But Sri Lankans are also encouraged to tie up with their foreign participants to raise funds abroad, debt to equity, to supplement the country's uh, uh, port city development activities. In the meantime, uh, Sri Lanka also need to develop its own foreign exchange market we are looking at a much more lower trade deficit by diversifying our exports, moving towards more competitive imports, and also to address our port-related IT and other service earnings um, and various tourism it takes to at least another one year to fully recover. In that context, we are not ready, to be very honest, we are not ready to create a crowding out of Sri Lankan foreign exchange market to develop the port city. Actually, the port city development requirement is far greater and it need to be with the participation of the foreign investment uh, with Sri Lankan companies. Sri Lanka has quite a reputed large listed companies and those conglomerates are quite capable of raising foreign money on the basis of 
on the strength of their own balance sheets like recently john keels did with the adani group on the uh, west terminal development in colombo port so i'm sure though it may look uh, somewhat tight in the early stage it is actually the incentive for everybody to look out look for international markets do international marketing talk to the international banks partnership with sri lankan companies and foreign companies and also the foreign sri lankan diaspora to target this market and that is why we have formulated the legislation on that basis okay uh, thank you very much once again uh, dr jay sundar uh, we are really uh, grateful to you for joining us today uh, i think uh, there are more questions but i hope that we can answer some of them at the end of our presentations during the q and a session so uh, let me uh, uh, go to our next presenters so let me now introduce our next presenter today talking about colombo port city driving towards a regional business center the opportunities and challenges he is a high level advisor in china on special economic zones and other similar initiatives which have become resounding successes he is a professor in economics president of the optical valley institute for free trade in china a distinguished fellow of jack austin center in canada and a research associate for Red, uh, federal reserve bank of dallas usa so joining us today all the way from china let me warmly welcome professor bo chen to address the webinar now thank you very much uh, let me first of all share my uh, screen okay so here we go um Thank you very much for inviting me again. Uh, in 2019, I was honored to, uh, to give a speech um, uh, for the similar events, uh, which talk about you know, the development of the China's free trade zones. And uh, uh, we want to share the experience of the Chinese development uh, for the Kelumpo Port City. And today I'm honored to uh, share my opinions again about the continuous development of the Colombo Port City, uh, which is the you know uh, the uh, the Colombo Port City driving to uh, the uh, region international regional business, uh, which will talk about the opportunities as well as the challenges. Uh, but I want to clarify myself first. Uh, the Colombo Port City here is not only referring to the project uh, that is actually undergoing now but also uh, the Colombo as a city or uh, Sri Lanka as a country, as a whole, how to develop itself uh, to be, you know, a kind of a, a, a promising land for investors and uh, for international business in the future. And uh, welcome to uh, all the questions. All right, so first of all, um, what is the uh, uh, opportunities uh, ahead of us? Uh, it's uh, apparently, uh, at least the most significant one would be Belt and Road Initiative uh, led by China. Uh, and the, the reason uh, is so apparent is because that uh, Colombo is located uh, strategically in the midway of the 21st century maritime Silk Road, which is here. <laughs> okay. uh, and so as we all know that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, proposed by Chinese President Xi uh, in 2013 and followed with uh, many countries kind of a warm-hearted response. And so far we have more than 64 countries actively participated in the construction and the development of the BNR uh, initiative. And, um, uh, and as you can uh, see from this, uh, uh, from this figure, uh, from this uh, 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 picture, uh, Colombo is located in the, just uh, uh, in a strategic position in the maritime uh, Silk Road. Um, and uh, with the very fast development of the uh, BRI, uh, BRI um, we can uh, easily tell that uh, Colombo will enjoy the big potential in trade, FDI, and international business in the near future. 
However, uh, before we talk about those uh, kind of uh, uh, you know opportunities as well as challenges, uh, we first of all have to uh, you know go back to our reality. Uh, as we all know, unfortunately, uh, in 2020, which is last year, we all suffered so much from the pandemic. Um, the whole world actually uh, hit very badly uh, by the pandemic, and uh, the uh, the global economy on average. Uh, uh, shrunk by 4.3%. And uh, the um, advanced economies actually uh, contracted even more by 5.4%. Uh, fortunately though, uh, China as the only major economy that received a, a positive growth, which is uh, 2%, actually according to the uh, World Bank's uh, uh, January report. Um, but I wanna, uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the most recent released data by Statistical China uh, is that uh, the Chinese actual economic growth last year was 2.3%. Uh, anyway, we are the only major economy that still have a very uh, have a positive economic growth uh, in the last year. Uh, and this shows actually China's economy is very strong and robust. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the BRI led by China and the other nation, the participating nations actually enjoyed a lot. Uh, we can uh, work together, not only uh, help us to develop ourselves very fast, but also help us to resist those uh, various kind of uh, 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 negative shocks like the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we all know that uh, uh, BRI is very important, but I want to emphasize here that is uh, BRI is the, I think the uh, for now the most significant opportunities for Sri Lanka. Of course, it is the uh, it is not the only one. Uh, Sri Lanka should uh, look at the whole world, uh, you know, in a neutral position for sure. Uh, but uh, when we are talking about BRI, um, uh, we we still uh, needs to be very cautious because uh, Sri Lanka seems uh, hasn't done a very uh, satisfactory job yet uh, with the development of the BRI. Uh, compared with other nations. Uh, so here I, I, I want to show you some kind of um, uh, uh, tables and the data. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the trade. Uh, if you uh, uh, look at the following um, figure, uh, please read from the uh, left-hand side. And that's uh, the blue bars shows you the China's uh, trade with the BRI nations in total. Uh, and uh, we can find actually the aggregate trade between China and the BI nations actually increased substantially after 2016. Um, but but if you look at uh, uh, the uh, you know the the figure from the right hand side, uh, which shows you actually the uh, China trade share with Sri Lanka compared to the aggregate trade with other uh, with all the BI nations. Uh, we, we find actually the share uh, exhibits uh, first increase and uh, decrease. Uh, for example, um, at the beginning of the BI initiative, uh, China and uh, China's trade with uh, Sri Lanka compared with other, uh, with, uh, with the uh, BI uh, aggregate uh, was about 0.38%, um, uh, which uh, increased uh, until 2016, peaked at uh, uh, almost uh, uh, 0.43% uh, 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 and then declined, unfortunately, uh, to uh, 2020, which is last year. And uh, in last year, it was barely above 0.3%, which means compared with the, uh, uh, with the whole BI uh, nations, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, bilateral trade with China was not that satisfactory. There's a lot of problems we need to, uh, we need to deal with. Uh, in order to uh, promote our bilateral trade, but I believe there is a big potential uh, between us and uh, other BI nations. Well, um, uh, so uh, after we talk, uh, after talking about the trade issue, uh, let's also uh, look at the you know uh, investment kind of uh, uh, aspects. Um, as we all know that uh, you know China. Uh, is uh, the most advanced, uh, you know, uh, countries with the uh, uh, capacity of infrastructure construction. So um, a lot of countries actually uh, 
to get, uh, work together with China on the infrastructure development. So Chinese firms uh, sign a lot of uh, contractual projects, uh, infrastructure projects with the uh, with other countries, especially the uh, BI nations. Uh, here I uh, give you a table shows you the number uh, the top ten uh, nations uh, which received the uh, most uh, Chinese uh, 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 investment projects uh, between 2014 to 2019. The reason why I excluded uh, 2020 was uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic actually sees a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, potential uh, projects. So based on the uh, 14 to 19, uh, six years kind of uh, uh, investment records, we find uh, uh, from the, the, this table that the uh, Chinese uh, uh, infrastructure uh, investment on those projects are mainly uh, concentrated on uh, Southeast Asia, like uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the South uh, Asian nations like uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Um, and, um, and the total value of the contractual projects in these top 10 countries amounted for 59% of the Chinese total amount of the contractual projects in the 64 uh, uh, BI nations. Uh, but uh, when we look at the data for Sri Lanka, it's actually ranked uh, actually uh, the 20s. Uh, it's fine, but not, not outstanding. Uh, consider, uh, considering uh, that Sri Lanka is located uh, geographically uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, strategically very important place. Uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka's uh, 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 attractions to the Chinese uh, uh, investment uh, investors on the infrastructure projects are uh, still has a big potential. Uh, and uh, and uh, so far, we got about 50, uh, 15 billion dollars kind of uh, uh, investment projects, uh, but uh, uh, I think compared with the economic size, compared with the you know uh, 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 geographical positions and strategic positions, Sri Lanka uh, deserve to have more such kind of uh, uh, projects. And uh, we also know that China is the world a largest manufacturing country, we got a nickname called uh, World Factory. So China has a huge uh, capacity on uh, manufacture. Um, and uh, uh, due to the Chinese economic upgrading and the structural change, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese manufacturing capacities are now moving uh, outwards. Uh, we are investing a lot, uh, outsourcing our uh, uh, production uh, capacities. And uh, uh, the, our, uh, so we built a lot of uh, industrial parks uh, in other nations, particularly in those uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, 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 countries. And uh, we find, uh, for example, Indonesia uh, still uh, on the top, uh, receive uh, nine uh, industrial parks uh, invested by uh, or established by the Chinese investors, uh, followed by Russia, eight, Cambodia, seven, Laos and Vietnam respectively have five, uh, industrial parks. And Sri Lanka is here. Sri Lanka only has one, uh, which is located in Hambatoba port. Um, and uh, uh, this one in Sri Lanka is the so-called diversified comprehensive kind of uh, industrial park. Um, part of the areas are de uh, developed for processing and manufacturing, and part of the area developed for business logistics. Um, so, uh, even though uh, Sri Lanka's GDP size cannot be comparable with Indonesia or Russia, but it is quite comparable with uh, Cambodia and Laos, uh, considering we have very similar economic size and uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, you know strategic importance. Uh, you know, uh, you know, just one industrial park actually shows that uh, there are still uh, a lot of job uh, we can do to promote the bilateral investment especially to promote uh, you know, the, the uh, Sri Lanka's attraction on developing uh, the, the manufacturing investment or uh, manufacturing sector. All right, so uh, uh, having said this, uh, my suggestions are the following six uh, fronts. The first is the uh, uh, Sri Lanka, especially Colombo, needs to make more international commitments on uh, external liberalization. For example, to join high quality agreements on free trade and investment, like for example, ASEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. 
uh, even though ASEP currently only includes uh, Asia Pacific nations. However, uh, uh, at, uh, at the beginning or uh, at the beginning stage of the ASEP negotiation, India was invited as well. So that means ASEP is open to South Asian nations. So it is a I think it is a good start for Colombo to uh, for Sri Lanka to consider. The second uh, is Colombo uh, can explore the geo economic advantages like to develop offshore trade, offshore R&D, uh, like uh, following the example of uh, Shannon free trade zone in Ireland with uh, you know, the attraction of the low tax and the high market efficiency, uh, which I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, Mr. Secretary to President has already mentioned a lot. So I will, uh, I, I will not uh, uh, talk more on this front. And the third suggestion is that uh, uh, we can develop modern logistics systems. Uh, I mean, not only the hardware like infrastructure, but also the software like information system, efficient and transparent government administration, uh, and the good paradigm is Singapore. Well, uh, and the, my fourth uh, suggestion is to develop uh, our high-end manufacturing sector as well. I know it is easy to say than do. Uh, most of the developing countries are emphasizing on developing their uh, manufacturing sector, uh, especially, uh, you know, for Sri Lanka in South Asia, uh, we have, uh, you know, we have India, we have Bangladesh, uh, which are focused on manufacturing as well. So we need to find a way to, uh, to differentiate our path of manufacturing. Okay, so my suggestion is we should consider uh, uh, the uh, development on reparation and the reproduction for equipment and the luxury goods, uh, considering you know, the consumption patterns of the uh, developed nations and, uh, and the emerging economies in Southeast Asia and China, uh, we have a, a huge demand on, uh, on uh, you know, the reparation and reproduction for equipment and luxury goods. And also I suggest uh, uh, Kalampo to grasp the opportunity on digital economy um, we should not only consider ourselves to develop, uh, you know, uh, our harbor uh, uh, for uh, exchange of the goods, but also uh, to develop ourselves as a uh, digital harbor or a data harbor for the globe. Uh, you know, for like, uh, for example, cloud data center, uh, e-business uh, data exchange center, etc. I think uh, uh, Colombo and Sri Lanka has a uh, very unique opportunities here because, first of all. Uh, it is a, uh, a politically neutral country uh, in history, got this reputation. Secondly, uh, its legal system is uh, uh, sound uh, compared with other developing countries. And the third, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, it is using English as the official language, which is quite useful in international business. Um, and uh, my, my last but not least uh, suggestion uh, for the development of a Colombo is to evolve itself to the world-class service uh, business, uh, like, uh, you know, to develop its freight and aviation service, uh, tourism, uh, to a, uh, upgrade its tourism uh, service uh, uh, standards, uh, and uh, also increase, uh, uh, improve the medical service and the environmental service, et cetera. Uh, well, about two years ago, I visited uh, Sri Lanka in person uh, and uh, got a very good impression about Sri Lanka. And uh, hopefully when the pandemic ended very soon, I can uh, bring my families uh, back to Sri Lanka again and enjoy the world-class service in Sri Lanka. Uh, okay, I think uh, uh, my time is over and thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very, thank you very much. Professor Bo Cheng uh, for your valuable contribution and for being uh, associated with working in Sri Lanka at a time like this when Sri Lanka needs the ex expertise of people of your caliber and I hope uh, you can return to Sri Lanka very soon with your family. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, so let me introduce our next presenter today to tell us about the most important and highly anticipated topic currently, legal and regulatory structures of international standing. He is uh, Sri Lanka's prominent legal luminary and as I understand has made a very important contribution towards formulating the legal framework for the Colombo Port City Commission. 
He has served in the committee appointed to review the proposed law governing the special economic zone of the Colombo Port City and participated in the process of finalizing the draft act. He is presently serving in the commission appointed by His Excellency the President for the purpose of simplification of existing laws and regulations in the interest of the people. Let me now warmly welcome President's Council Nihal Jawadana to address the webinar. Thank you Deepthi and good afternoon everyone. Uh, the The law is uh, considered as one of the most uh, essential marketing tools of this uh, special economic zone which has been designed and uh, as uh, discussed before me by the two eminent speakers uh, uh, this afternoon. Now, this law had to be drafted or law has been uh, evolving and there has been certain policy changes at the time of the law being drafted. There was a draft that was done by some uh, other experts at the beginning and we had the privilege uh, of reviewing that draft and uh, conceptualizing it on the present day need, which was to be uh, at one time considered to be a financial uh, center, international financial center, which was changed to be a uh, port city special economic zone, which is a fairly broad based uh, unit than what was initially expected. So, the, uh, the reclamation of that physical unit was done by uh, another essential participant of in this exercise by Czech Port City Colombo Private Limited which is considered as the project company. Uh, and uh, the land reclamation part has been almost completed and uh, it is now in the uh, phase that the physical development uh, of the reclaimed land uh, is to be carried out. Now for this, uh, this would involve the active participation of the investors who are supposed to be the most important segment that should uh, get involved and uh, in order to get them involved in this exercise uh, we need a tool which can be used also as a marketing tool and that is the purpose uh, with which this act uh, had to be uh, formulated. So the, the act in the bill form has been gazetted and it will be presented in the parliament very soon. And uh, I would very briefly discuss some of the features uh, that has been taken into account in uh, formulating this piece of legislation. As I mentioned, there was this project company which got involved in the uh, physical development of uh, the landmass and they would also get involved in some of the developments that I envisaged. Uh, and uh, the most important body that uh, would regulate this uh, special economic zone would be the Colombo Port City Commission. 
the Colombo Port City Commission would be a seven member commission which would be appointed by the uh, president amongst uh, best individuals who would suit to hold such positions who have the expertise in the required areas selected nationally and internationally. The, the law also should give a message as to why the investor should come to Sri Lanka and this Colombo port city and with that in mind we uh, designed this uh, piece of legislation. The Colombo Port City Commission, the basic concept is not something alien to us as discussed by I think Dr. Jayasundar at the beginning. We had similar laws like the Board of Investment law and there had been, we had experiences uh, as to how this kind of a thing should be uh, operated to the optimum possible uh, level. So with that in mind, we wanted to uh, make this regulator the main facilitator of the activities that are going to be uh, taken place at this uh, unit which is called the Port City uh, Economic Center. In order to do that, we thought the prime duty of the regulator, the regulating body, the commission, should be to facilitate investment and the special economic zone activity without any hindrance uh, in a very regular manner, in a, uh, without uh, I mean, in, in, on a level playing field for all investors and all who would make use of this opportunity to take part in the business activities that are going to take place in this business center. So with that in mind, the commission has been uh, designed and it has been given wide powers which are uh, discussed uh, in the early parts of the part 2 of the act. Uh, the basic function of the uh, or function duties and powers of the commission are discussed in section 6 of the uh, draft act. Uh, and uh, these have been done for the furtherance of national interest or the interest of the advancement of the national economy. So th these are the basic uh, tenants on which this legislation has been built on. Now, for those purposes, the commission will take care of the landmass that has been uh, reclaimed and that landmass comprises of uh, 292 hectares uh, out of which in accordance with a tripartite agreement that was entered into in August 2016, 116 hectares or 43% uh, has been agreed to be leased to the project company as project company marketable land. Because they made the investment, they pledged uh, 1.5 billion 
investment out of which already about 1 billion has been spent and the balance out of the balance land mass 62 hectares would be government marketable land government could market those lands to the investors and there is another portion of land which again will be in the control of the government those uh, lands are there uh, those are non marketable land or common areas roads parks and entertainment areas uh, would comprise of that 34% of the land mass so that is how the land is allocated and uh, the, this uh, out of the project company marketable land in accordance with the master plan that has been done 48 uh, in respect of 48 land parcels there will be master leases which would be signed with the uh, project company out of which 24 has been signed by uh, November 2019 and there are others which have to be done the land that was reclaimed was initially declared as state land which was subsequently vested with the UDA and with the coming into force of this act the land that was vested with the UDA would be vested by operation of law with the commission and of course in order to regularize on the request of the Honorable Attorney General those uh, the, the vesting with the UDA would be officially revoked and then uh, the President would vest the lands with the commission once the law comes into operation. So the leases that were done with the UDA would by operation of law will be deemed to be land that will be uh, vested with the commission and uh, the commission will be an essential part of any leases or subleases that are going to take place later on it's not a new thing it is uh, a similar practice that is been adopted in respect of UDA held lands even as of now so there is no change in the process of the law that has been adopted and also with the law that was applicable earlier and the law that that we are familiar with this is just a, a change in the same direction but for efficient transformation and ease of doing business uh, it will be vested with the the facilitator who is also the regulator main regulator in this operation so as I mentioned earlier the main function of the regulator any regulator for that matter is facilitation in order to give some kind of a impetus to the the uh, growing uh, business concerns in the area so facilitation is one of the most important aspects that uh, the uh, uh, commission is looking at now for this purpose the act itself has very specifically identified uh, or identified a function of the commission as a single window business facilitator now this is been done 
by way of certain other requirements the act taken as a whole requires certain permissions to be obtained in order to carry on business in the demarcated area of the port city now for a company to operate in the port city area the company uh should also obtain a registration as an offshore business now for the purposes of operations the law deems the the operations that are carried out within the precincts of the port city as offshore operations that's again not a uh, new concept to our law this is there very clearly in the companies act number 7 of 2007 the same provisions that are that were there in i believe part 9 of the companies act have been brought into part 7 of the proposed legislation and the identical provisions almost a mirror image of what is there in the, the in part 9 of the companies act relating to offshore companies has been brought in to uh, the uh, proposed act uh, as uh, the uh, as part 7 which uh, uh, requires the companies which are operating within that zone to be registered as offshore companies by the registrar of companies so there are so many other regulatory authorities which operate or which uh, will have a specific function to perform in respect of the businesses that would uh, operate within this zone now if it is a banking company in addition to obtaining the permission as envisaged in part 7 they should also obtain uh, a banking license offshore banking business to carry out offshore banking business within the port city economic zone as per part 8 of the act so you see that i mean if i mean there are various other regulators who would come in but if i just take for demonstration purposes these two regulatory bodies which are already functioning and already uh, referred to in the act the commission will facilitate the uh, registration process of a company as an offshore company in addition the commission will also now if a company which needs to carry out its businesses as a banking company would facilitate as the single window facilitator in addition to being re- registered as a offshore company to be registered as a offshore banking company with the regulator the monetary board so there are uh, various regulatory bodies which will have to give certain authorizations now the act has envisaged to ensure this process will be a smooth process a quicker process and be done in respect of genuine proper investors who would seek uh, investment opportunities within this uh, special economic zone which in fact as professor bochen uh, very correctly said is situated at a very strategic position and uh, there are so many advantages for new businesses who seek uh, opportunities in such zones 
to uh, establish a business place. So in that process, the process has been streamlined by requiring the commission to act as the sing single window facilitator. For that purpose, there will be various uh, authoritative senior officials who may have to set up the sub officers within the, uh, the commission itself or in, in the vicinity of the, the premises within which the commission operates. So, and there are certain permissions that will have to be given now, for permissions for visas and various other uh, resident permissions, uh, permissions and that kind of thing. So those authorities will also be uh, not the authority itself, but the uh, placing various uh, authoritative personalities from those uh, regulatory bodies will also be looked at and it has been facilitated through this act. The commission is the main uh, body and thereafter there is another uh, guarantee company established under the Companies Act which would be doing the uh, estate management of the, the Colombo Port City and uh, that would uh, uh, be attending to all uh, amenities, the provision of various uh, uh, common amenities by various uh, service providers, the electricity, telecom, uh, garbage disposal, sewerage disposal and that kind of thing would be done by the uh, estate management company and uh, the estate management company under the supervision and regulation of the commission uh, would be charging certain charges in respect of the services that it would provide to the uh, uh, persons who are occupying the port city uh, special economic area. Then uh, there will be entertainment uh, and uh, tourism related activity. There is a marina bay which will be uh, fully functional and that uh, type of uh, things are there. Um, then there will be development regulations within the port city, even the development of the buildings and uh, the infrastructure, it is in a very regulated uh, manner and those, are, those have been done and regulations would be uh, made on the recommendations of the commission by the president which would be gazetted and uh, uh, passed by the parliament in a regular manner. Then uh, the uh, there is the ability to occupy condominiums, purchase condominium properties in accordance with uh, initially with the until uh, the commission sets regulations uh, with regard to the condominium purchases. It will be under the prevailing law, Condominium Authority Management Act. And uh, uh, similar or identical regime in order to uh, be operated in an easier manner or a, um, 
in a consumer friendly manner would be adopted in time to come there is the possibility of condominium properties being owned by individuals local and foreign uh, in accordance with the the prevailing laws and uh, there will be no need for uh, any change and again the facilitation of these would be looked after overall by the by the commission then one of the other most important things that i had to uh, say before concluding my remarks is that there is no change in the legal structure the law that would be applicable in the country will apply to the special economic zone the code structure would be the same code structure but of course there are for the interest in the national economy and the growth for the purpose of uh, the greater national interest there will be uh, expeditious disposal or priority being given to uh, the special cases which uh, would emanate from the uh, special economic zone which is also not something new there are various other laws which give that kind of uh, priority in the disposal process of cases then there is this uh, the conflict resolution center uh, which will have the uh, uh, proper international level arbitration facility and uh, the other dispute resolution mechanisms such as mediation and conciliation and that kind of thing would be within that and for that the best standards would be adopted and the best facilities would be set up and these are within the government areas and in the government areas there will be a uh, uh, top level international school for which there are certain branded international schools have already made uh, certain uh, inquiries there will be a uh, high level international standard hospital and a conference center which is been uh, uh, the conference center is aimed at uh, the uh, uh, ever growing uh, mice market uh, for which sri lanka does not at the moment have that capacity so uh, this uh, economic zone has all those uh, facilities accommodation in the form of residence or even uh, top level hotels to cater for those and uh, the countries like singapore and such uh, countries where this sector is being exploited uh, has got all such facilities at one place which we can certainly provide at this and for that again investors can be attracted so this is a law that uh, in fact has uh, looked at all those things and particularly and most importantly in the interest of the national economy we have uh, formulated this law to be very uh, to be as much simple as possible and also uh, to use this law as a uh, not as a reference law but as a as one legislative uh, 
instrument so that it will facilitate even a person who looks at it from outside, a potential investor, and uh, uh, would uh, uh, be easy for him to decide as to why he should invest in the Kalam Port City Economic Zone. I thank you and welcome any queries that uh, you may have specific queries in the uh, area of this law. Thank you very much. Javadana for being with us today amongst your uh, very busy schedule and thank you very much again for clarifying many important aspects about the uh, Colombo Port City Commission. And uh, we are actually having some questions which were uh, which I think you can answer as well. I hope you will be here uh, towards the end. Yes. Yes, okay. So, because uh, we, we are having a lot of questions and uh, some are addressed to uh, Mr. Javadan as well. So, uh, we are planning to take up as many as possible at the end of the uh, presentations during our Q&A session. So, all the participants uh, keep rolling in, uh, keep rolling in your questions. Um, so, last but not least, let me introduce our fourth presenter to talk to us about one of the most challenging aspects, the developer's perspective on post city development. He's a reputed business strategist and a financial advisor with international experience in corporate wealth creation with 20 plus years of experience in London, Melbourne and Colombo. Let me warmly welcome the Assistant Managing Director of the Czech Post City Private Limited, Mr. Tulsi Alvihar. Mr. Aluhari, you can take Thank it. you. Thank you, Deepthi. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me try and share the screen. Can you see the screen, Deepthi? Yes, we can see the screen. You can um, go to the whole screen, I think. We can see the screen. Yes. Okay. It's okay now. Right. right. Asia's newest landscape. Um, I would like to really give an investor uh, or a developer's perspective. So my short presentation, I will give you a, a quick update about the progress we have made in the Port City and the need. Why do we need such a special economic zone for a successful realization of this? One of the largest uh, foreign direct investments in Sri Lanka. One second. Right. Um, there are th these are some of the pictures. Uh, what you can see on the top is the landscaping and utility corridors in progress in the south. Uh, the central park, actually, these are part of a central park, which is being completed as we speak. Road, uh, foot, and vehicular bridges are under construction. And thus far, to date, we have invested over $1 billion uh, and it's a foreign direct investment. It did not involve any loan uh, from the government uh, of China or any other uh, multilateral agencies. Port City was declared under the Colombo administration district in August uh, 2019. There were three rounds of EIS uh, with public comments. Uh, Two EIS were conducted for reclamation works. Uh, we received over 200 written submissions uh, and there are 76 conditions stipulated in the uh, approval or the license. And there is an uh, environmental management plan in place at the moment to ensure that we adhere to those license conditions. And the third EIA was concluded more recently, that is for the vertical development. Uh, development control regulations, uh, which has four volumes, one is on urban design, uh, landscaping, uh, utilities, and most importantly, sustainability. So these are best in class international guidelines where any developer who develops within Port City has to strictly adhere to. Now with this law coming into place, enforcement control or the right will be now vested with the commission. As of now, 
close to 100 hectares of land is now ready for construction. As all of you know, Economic Commission bill was approved by the cabinet and hopefully it will be tabled in parliament very soon. As Dr. Jayasundara uh, just mentioned earlier, hopefully uh, we will see uh, this bill being enacted before end of the month. Colombo International Financial Center mixed use project. Uh, in addition to the, the billion invested on the reclamation and related utility works, we have, the project company also, have come forwarded, uh, come forwarded with a, a further investment about a billion to kickstart vertical development. The conceptual designs originally was done by SOM out of US and we now uh, is being re-looked at by Callison RTKL. And we hope to break ground on that first landmark development in the second half of this year. And a transitionary duty, uh, downtown duty-free store will also be ready before end of the year. Some timelines on the infrastructure. So by mid this year, we hope to complete the bridges, the roadways and the boulevard. Uh, water and sewage before end of this year. Landscaping again before end of the year. And by mid next year, June 22, 2022, all utility connections to the boundary of each plot on phase one will be completed. Now, while we do this utility connections um, or the infrastructure development, bringing Port City to life is quite crucial. So uh, last year in September, uh, an aqua golf range was uh, duly opened by, uh, by uh, the Prime Minister. Before end of this year, you will see a first downtown duty free in Port City and the beach and parks will be ready uh, for public. Uh, it will be open for public before end of this year and some other lesser activities that we have planned to bring Port City to life. Uh, in designing the Port City master plan, I think it's important to emphasize that there were, uh, there were significant emphasis given to create a vibrant a business hub district because it's extension to the existing CBD. So the master plan was devised in a manner that phase one, which consists of about 40 plots of the total 74 plots is very much tilted or geared towards attracting uh, investments for commercial spaces. So you can see office, retail, hospitality, and few others, right? 74% is for commercial purposes. And if you look at phase two, which consists of about 34 plots, is predominantly for residential use. What you see in those light colors are for residential use. So the thinking is the commercial success in phase one is quite important for us to drive the demand or successful outcome of phase two. And for us to drive demand for phase one, trade and commerce must happen. Uh, GDP growth of what we are expecting now in Sri Lanka is not going to be sufficient for us to actually see a successful completion of Port City. So creating the secondary demand is key. When I say secondary demand, the primary demand is really the developers who will come and invest to put up their office towers, uh, the, the residential uh, dwellings, uh, lesser activities, hotels. Now, for primary developers to be confident that their investment would be successful, they need to ensure that there is a secondary demand. Who will come and occupy these office spaces is a question. So there are certain priority sectors that we have identified uh, in Port City. However, having said that, the positioning at the moment is with the law, it is positioned as a multi-service, as you see. And as we evolve, we can see which sectors will uh, be actually will be highly attractive to set up in Port City. And also, I think the law will also evolve to facilitate uh, those sectors uh, who show much more keen interest to set up in Port City. So what you see on the top right corner in green, those are natural strengths of Sri Lanka, international trade, logistic operations, hospitality, tourism. 
what you see uh, in the middle in yellow shade is priority sector but needs some enablers to put in place because sri lanka as a, uh, a destination for business for global businesses i i don't think personally that we are still on the radar the destination appeal like uh, you have in singapore or hong kong we need to create that destination appeal in colombo so these sectors i think with the with the law proposed law i think would be would be uh, attractive for them to really come and set up uh, in port city the uh, bottom uh, left corner which we say as innovation hub obviously it is a priority for any uh, azz especially focusing on uh, financial services offshore banking uh, private equity etc that we create a innovation hub however in sri lanka because of investments in r and d uh, at a, a dime actually about 0.1% compared to countries like uh, singapore about 2.2% we are still not quite there so for this i think uh, dr jayasundara mentioned about uh, creating a knowledge economy uh, reforms in the education sector i think with these reforms uh, with a national agenda uh, and once the commission is established i hope we can we can drive port city also as a innovation hub so competition what we need to understand is competition in this part of the region to attract capital and talent is quite high and that intensified post covid now even developed countries embarked on bold reforms in uae where foreign investors were not permitted to own majority stake over 51% before more recently they relaxed that regulation where now foreign investors are permitted to even own 100% of companies outside their free zones citizenship laws were liberalized in uae to attract more investors talent and intellectuals hong kong and singapore also moved to attract tech finance and entrepreneurial talent they are relaxing their residential visa requirements uh, they are giving uh, fiscal incentives for identified uh, sectors because uh, especially singapore has an aging population they feel that they have come to a level which the economy uh, will saturate hence the attracting the required talent they have identified as one of the key priorities then the developing countries have also fast track reform agenda india land labor liquidity laws of india is going through a reform and they have set aside 10% of their gdp i mean indian gdp is about 2.5 trillion dollars so they have set aside 10% of that for reforms uh, then indonesia uh, indonesia is simplifying their laws uh, close to 79 80 laws have been looked at and they are relaxing laws and regulation predominantly or primarily to really to position themselves to attract foreign investment Philippines immediately cut their tax rates to 25%, which was 30% uh, before pre-COVID, and also I think there are plans to cut further by about 5%, offering incentives even up to 40 years. So the point I'm trying to make is, post-COVID competition is quite intense. The question is, can Sri Lanka or Colombo position ourselves to attract the required capital? so thus it's key that the port city as easy makes a statement among these so the need to create a conducive business environment now this is the world bank ease of doing business ranking if you see sri lanka we are ranked 99 of 180 countries now the chart on the bottom really shows you how we have progressed as a nation so in 2015 we were 99 as you could see we haven't really moved whereas if you look at the two largest democracies india and china india was 130 five years ago they have jumped to 63 with significant reforms and they are continuing to making reforms uh, china was 84 and they are now 31 and more recently china has introduced a further law to attract foreign investment and their target is to come between 50 15 in the next 
five years. So it is important if you look at these, these indicators that we, we are not really in the radar of the global investor business community. Now, what the Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill does is it addresses some of these pain points which we have faced in the, in the mainland or in Colombo for us to have a really a poor quality FDI track record. I mean, if you look at the last 10 years, Sri Lanka's FDI is quite pathetic. And of those, what he recorded also, actually more than 50% was reinvestment by existing foreign company. So if you really dissect that to understand how many new projects FBI we had driven, it is quite poor. So what this law does is it addresses certain pain points. So starting a business, construction permits, getting electricity, registering a property through the single window facilitator, which is the commission. Uh, we hope these issues where now we are ranked quite badly uh, would be addressed and we might be able to position in the top 25 once the law is enacted and implemented. Also enforcing contracts at the best, uh, we take about four years uh, to enforce contracts. And in this law, there's a clause that uh, uh, an authorized person which is allowed to operate within Port City have to apply for a uh, license from the commission and that license will have a provision that if when there is any dispute arising uh, doing business in Port City, that this needs to be referred to the International Commercial Dispute Resolution Center before it is referred to the courts. However, having said that, there is also a clause uh, giving priority to hear any civil and commercial legal proceedings within our existing court system. So this is with the law, law was actually the missing piece. In fact, the land and related infrastructure had been ready. Uh, so there were some delays uh, we, 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 we were faced with, uh, with the law, uh, but must say that now uh, the law, what has been built uh, is quite progressive. So the five year strategic plan for us is we have identified about 20 plots mostly located uh, adjacent to the existing CBD as pilot projects. And we want to kickstart those and drive the demand. So this includes uh, pure office to mixed use development. We call uh, social infrastructure, which is an international school, uh, hospital and a convention hotel, waterfront mixed use development here, some of the iconic hotels and integrated resorts. So these, 20 lots, which we hope to drive demand. We hope uh, that that amounts to about 60 hectares of land, uh, land mass at today's price. The investment would amount to about $5 billion. So this is our rollout strategy. So collaborations with industry associations to attract secondary demand is quite key. Uh, I mentioned, I think associating with chambers and any other organizations with links uh, to overseas chambers is quite important. And also, I think Dr. Jayasundara mentioned that uh, through overseas mission, also we will be promoting uh, Sri Lanka and giving that destination appeal uh, for the businesses to relocate or set up their headquarters uh, in Colombo. So also we are establishing regional network of marketing agencies. Uh, initially, we have looked at India, Singapore, Middle East, and China. Uh, we will expand this as we go along. Uh, then series of virtual events such as this have been organized to cater to a global audience until uh, travel uh, resumes. And physical events, once back to normal, we will have road shows in these identified uh, destinations to promote Sri Lanka. Well, I must say that we cannot promote Port City without promoting Sri Lanka. So we need to promote Sri Lanka, Colombo, and Port City. So that is our strategy. And we initially planned our inaugural international marketing launch uh, in July last year at the World City Summit in Singapore. Due to COVID that got postponed and then we hope that they will uh, resume that uh, next year. Last uh, slide, but not the least, benefits of Port City 
uh, as easy for Sri Lanka. Uh, I think driving economy towards a high value modern services is quite uh, key. So we have a services sector predominantly 60, almost 60% uh, contributed to the GDP, but still we focus on uh, traditional services. Whereas modern services like ITC, uh, financial services, professional services have been growing. If you look at last 10 years, close to a double digit, about nine, 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 nine and a half percent in the last 10 years. Whereas services that predominantly consist of traditional services have been growing at about 5%, but the contribution of modern services to the GDP of Sri Lanka is only 8%. So we hope with the establishment of this uh, best in class infrastructure uh, augmented by the, the software that was required with the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Act, we will be able to drive more export of services. Uh, 130 plus in direct jobs uh, would be created. I mean, one of the, the biggest issues Sri Lanka is currently facing is, is the brain drain. About close to 100,000 skilled workers emigrate every year. Of that 100,000, about 25,000 are professionals who leave Sri Lanka for better economic opportunity. And having creating that better economic opportunity next door, uh, we hope that the brain drain will also be arrested uh, somewhat. Booster local construction material supplies. I think Dr. Jayasundra touched upon the supply chain. So once the port city during construction and operational, they will source their supplies from the mainland. And for those supplies, they will pay in any foreign currency. So it is an export for for Colombo and rest of Sri Lanka to Port City and the much needed inward foreign remittances will flow into the country. Uh, 15 billion is the investment value at today's cost uh, to complete the construction of Port City according to the master plan that was agreed. Of that, we expect about nine and a half, ten billion. presentation. Maybe I think we can start with the Q&A session. I think, uh, I hope that all the other panelists are here to answer the questions and the participants are also here because we are going to start the Q&A se session now. Uh, and we will try to, uh, oh, I, think, I think I can see uh, Mr. Alvihare is connected. Okay, Hello. right. Yeah, Sorry. I hope you can finish. Yes. I think you were on your last slide, uh, Mr. Ali. Last slide again. On your last slide. Uh, uh, no, your ski, uh, screen is not shared yet. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Aluhare, for your very, very informative presentation. And it's, it's very exciting to see how a plain uh, reclaimed land uh, developing into a fully fledged city. So we are all excited to see that. Uh, so let me now uh, start the Q&A session. And uh, I would like to invite the Managing Director of uh, Vimansa Initiative, Mr. Lakshman Siruvardhana, to uh, conduct the Q&A session and then uh, deliver the closing remarks. So thank you all very much.
to answer your question i i would say that we have a very uh, good legal system with regard to the uh, dispute resolution particularly the arbitration act that is prevalent in sri lanka uh if not for certain practical reasons why it has not been a successful um, uh, tool to for dispute resolutions internally uh, the act itself provides a very sound legal framework for dispute resolution it's based on the exit model and uh, which is uh, internationally well known and what we lack right now is a uh, arbitration center with uh, the international level facilities which is going to be set up which has been designed which has been planned and everything has been done so it's a matter for any international party to make use of that this can be a center not only for arbitrations that will emanate from within the port city or from sri lanka i will swear in sri lanka i mean i would say port city is the uh, special economic city that is to be created by this act it is within a certain geographical location and within that there will be businesses set up and to create a, a, a existing market for uh, this dispute resolution uh, procedures the law has included a compulsory provision where uh, employment contracts plus the other 
uh, contracts that the commission would enter into with the investors to have a dispute resolution clause which uh, requires the use using of arbitration as a tool so the arbitration center can be used for that purpose uh, within the 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 business area itself in addition if greater facilities are provided uh, which is what is going to be uh, arbitrations that emanate elsewhere in sri lanka can be uh, forwarded to the arbitration center within the port city and since this is to be developed as an international arbitration center it would also attract not only the two types of things that i mentioned that is ones which come up within the port city ones which come up outside the port city within sri lanka and most importantly this can be used as a international arbitration center to which various others could bring in their disputes for resolution so it will be a, a, a center which will bring in a lot of foreign income through the operations of an efficient state of the art arbitration center uh, within that port city with all those facilities and especially during this covid period there are so many arbitrations that are being conducted through zoom and that kind of uh, uh, u- utilizing technology so the technology can be used in this kind of a state of the art dispute resolution center which will again bring in uh, uh, very many users of uh, international nature so i think uh, it is well documented in the law itself plus uh, infrastructure and other arrangements have been made so i think that uh, the the uh, the person who raised this question does not have to worry anything about it and that those have been addressed not only in the law and I, 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 the other facilities also have been provided and planned for right thank you i suppose uh, that uh, that she was very well addressed by uh, the president council of the mahal jawala then there is another question which i think tulsi should be able to tulsi is there i suppose It should be able to address that is uh, a sri lankan is making that at the moment countries investing heavily or at least spending heavily on educate education edu- providing education to their children uh, in foreign countries and therefore he is asking whether there what are the plans for the higher education sector or collaboration foreign universities etc with the, with within the port city so see yeah thank you uh, lakshman so according to the master plan uh, which was devised and agreed with the government there is a dedicated a uh, two and a half hectare block for a, a reputed international school now when i say international school actually targeting primary and secondary education and also there is a lot of interest so far uh, from uk boarding schools to to set up here uh there is no uh, plan devised for a, a university at the moment uh, however what i can tell you is that if there is uh, such a demand our existing commercial uh, plots which have been identified and dedicated uh, for commercial development can be utilized for for such a uh, opportunity if there was demand and we are quite we are quite keen that we kind of create that ecosystem within port city to promote knowledge based uh, activities 
you know that is obviously a part of the the vision uh, of the government as well so uh, we hope there will be demand uh, from a university and at the appropriate time we will also seek uh, or approach some of these business schools to come and uh, set up in port city which will complement the larger port city development opportunities for the for the small i don't know what they mean by small is a relative term investment opportunities available for the small investors uh, in the project such as purchasing a small apartment etc mm. and within bracket he says expect the brown uh, the joint venture with uh, within yeah so uh, <laughs> there is plenty of opportunity depending on uh, what scale of investment you are looking at from small medium to a large uh, when i said large is the primary developers we are attracting to develop for the small time uh, to medium time uh, investors obviously uh, the question say they can invest in real estate uh, meaning buying apartments uh, directly or they can partner on the supply chain side now promoting tourism within port city is one of the primary activities right you can imagine the impact of the supply chain uh, that is required to promote that tourism so depending on what sector or what his speciality is i'm sure there's plenty of opportunity either to directly invest in port city or be part of the the supply chain requirement of uh, port city looking at the kalambu port city project today and with this legislation coming in think about a project that has been uh, suspended for one more than one and a half years for reason of best known to the, the the leaders at that time still coming out of such a challenge and proceeding to become a reality in the near future is a great achievement at the same time therefore the uh, the vimansa initiative our, that is our think tank we are thinking of going ahead with another program in couple of months time on the environmental aspect green development aspect of this port city connecting to the green aspect of the belt and road initiative as well as well, as well. in the meantime in my, as my concluding remarks i would like to mention the, to get the attention of the resource person as well as the uh, uh, the participants that we are planning to have two more uh, one is on the general economy the, the trend of the general economy that will be done as a single webinar single medium webinar with the sri lanka one of the most respected and distinguished uh, person will be presenting it's a kind of solo solo uh, single presentation on the economy with probably with hopefully with the participation of uh, of certain uh, local chambers of commerce and industry and captains of industry the other webinar that we are targeting is uh, and again and a single medium this is this is probably for the first time we will be doing a webinar on uh, the centenarial uh, term with the, the 100 years of chinese communist party of china that making a very much a analytical presentation by expert on the field in singala but there will be one or more chinese academics speaking in singala language and that will be another first in sri lanka anyway thank you very much once again for all those who participated especially the very highly professional team from dr pibijay sundara thank you uh, his time is really 
uh, uh, very precious, but he spent that time. Then followed by Professor Bo Chen from China. And thank you. I hope that you will continue your interest in our Port City project as well as other developments in Sri Lanka as in the past. Then third, you have the, our uh, President Council, uh, Mr. Nihal Jawadana. I mean, he did the he has already invested a lot of his time uh, on this project, uh, on this bill as well. I mean, relatively young, bright guy from the Czech port city uh, for, for cooperating with us. Let's uh, think beyond this seminar and have a good day for all. Uh, thank you very much.